Say hello, I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, April 27th. And I saw I missed you for a couple of weeks back from vacation, so we'll pick it up from where we left off. Um, but let me say, while this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage and in some cases start conversations. Uh, we don't do prayers and Buffalo speeches. We take a tough look at history, oppression, and survival. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity. And we may step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to bring people together by, by breaking down what separates us. We'll take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us. And we do it all right here from the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. Uh, so let's talk Native. But before I do that, let's, let me remind people that our audio streams live at www.letstalknative.com. And we stream video of the show on Facebook Live. We take our audio and we post it up on SoundCloud, and which puts it out as a podcast on all your favorite podcast platforms. And we also take the video and we put it up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, Let's Talk Native TV. Uh, I am the host of Let's Talk Native, and I'm assisted by Jake Proud here in studio, who is uh, managing our video and our sound, which is sometimes a challenge because every time we go through one of these updates with uh, with our camera system, we we um, stream live using a special camera for live streaming called Mevo. And um, they, they upgrade the uh, up, upgrade and update the uh, uh, the software, and sometimes it gives, it gives us a glitch here and there. But uh, we seem to be doing good tonight, and uh, so we hope you enjoy the stream. Um, a couple of things. I opened up with, uh, with Charlie Lowry um, do, uh, and Dark Water Rising uh, performing uh, um, My Fun. And um, my thoughts go out to Charlie Lowry. She was expecting to get a tr kidney transplant this week. And I guess something in the compatibility with her donor, which looked good at the beginning, but uh, had a few um, combat compatibility issues associated with antibiotics or something like that, or antibodies in their system that uh, uh, made her match no longer be appropriate. So she's either w looking at doing some sort of kidney swap with, with donors or trying to find, just have herself placed back on a list. So, um, uh, she'll continue with her dialysis. She she posted a live video, um, and she's tough, man. She she smiles through the whole thing, and she puts on a a very brave face. I mean, because she is brave. But um, uh, I know many of us were hopeful that uh, um, this coming week she would have uh, you know been able to get her life back by no longer having to go through dialysis. So our thoughts go out. I'm not. I don't do prayers here, but my thoughts do go out and. Uh, and I, you know, I offer my sentiments and my good well wishes uh, to to Charlie Lowry, and we'll we'll play another one of her tunes uh, when we get down to the bottom of the hour. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Hey, I want to thank uh, my my friend uh, uh, Gunnar Latio for uh, buying me dinner tonight uh, down from Aquasasni, and I, I appreciate uh, appreciate being fed. <laughs> um, uh, one other thing before I get into the subject matter that I really want to talk about is. Um, the mascot issue is uh, is going to be covered here locally. Um, uh, one of the, the networks here got a hold of me while I was on my vacation. Uh, they're trying to localize what has taken place in Maine, where the state of Maine has now uh, pro passed a law prohibiting uh, high schools from using native mascots. And uh, so I got the call uh, while I was on vacation. We're going to do something. This will air sometime in May. I'll give you more information when when the the story is going to air and that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, because of our battle with, um, or our assistance, I should not even battle, our assistance with Lancaster School District in getting rid of the R word for their mascot. And, and of course, we still have a fair number of teams in the area that have native mascots. They may not all have a racial slur for a name, but uh, um, there are still two in New York State that, uh, that do carry the R word for their mascot. So um, that that's coming up sometime in uh, next month. So uh, we'll keep our... I'll keep my ears open, and I'll uh, uh, as to when that's actually going to take place, and I'll let you know. All right, I gotta look. I've got to get back. I know that there's probably some of you who are just like, man, are we is he going to cover the 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 revenue sharing issue again? Well, and I have to, and I have to for a couple of reasons. Look, I know that not um, everybody catches every show that I do here, and. And I have to say it, I mean, and, and maybe it pains me a little bit to say this, but there is no bigger issue facing the Seneca people. And, and, and I'm more talking about short term, but even mid, mid range term, there's no bigger issue than this revenue sharing issue with the, with the state. And I call it the billion dollar battle because 
It is. It's a fight over a billion dollars. The Seneca Nation has already paid the state $1.4 billion for, for a revenue-sharing de deal that really is illegal by the underlying federal statute, Indian Ga the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. They didn't, the state didn't give anything up. The state already did not allow Class 3 gaming. So when the Senecas, along with the Oneidas and the Mohawks, opened up casinos, they already had exclusivity because nobody else could do it except for Native people. So the idea that the state would claim that they were actually offering something of value to the Senecas for what would turn out to be, it would have been $1.6 billion, but the Senecas kept $200 million uh, during that, their battle over a breach of that, uh, that so-called exclusivity. But $1.4 billion for something that the state didn't give it. The state didn't say, okay, we're going to surrender something to you. They didn't do it. And now, after getting $1.4 billion, the state is still trying to fight them for another billion dollars. So this is a billion-dollar battle. And I'm going to refer to it. Anytime you hear me talk about the billion-dollar battle with the state, this is what I'm talking about. This is the state trying to squeeze the Seneca people for a billion dollars out of their gaming revenue. So... I mean, I've got to talk about this stuff. And, and I got to tell you, if you're a Seneca, you should be calling every one of your counselors and your executives, and you should find out what is their position. I mean, you should poll these guys. So not just in an open session or a council session, but you should be polling each one of your 16 counselors to say, well, what is your position on this thing? Because, because I got to tell you, right now, the Senecas are fighting this thing, even though the arbitra an arbitration ruling came down that uh, that suggests that actually is ordering the Senecas to pay, uh, even though the compact never called for payments past 14 years. But this two white men, and we'll, I'll talk about that too, on the arbitration panel saying, no, it's our, it's our impression, it's our opinion that, uh, that the Seneca's revenue sharing should continue. Not because the language says so. They said, well, you paid it for 14 years. So if you renewed the compact, we're suggesting that you've got to continue payment just on the basis of renewing the previous compact, even though there's, or, or the existing compact, even though there's no language for that. So this, and the Senate Nation's fighting that. And what they're fighting it on, on a reasonable um, basis, on a reasonable argument. And the argument is in the absence of language say, calling for payments past 14 years, these arbitrators, two of the three, the two white men, and I've got to say that, and, and I'll address it later on as we go. The two white men are basically saying, we're rewriting the compact. We're adding language to it. We're, we're adding language that isn't there. We're saying you have to pay for the next seven years, and we're even going to tell you what rate you have to pay it because that's not, that's not in the compact either. We're, gonna, we're ordering you to pay 25% of the net slot drop of your slot machines, your class three slot machines. For the next seven years. And that's a billion dollars, folks. That's a billion dollars. through. That's payments through 2023. So again, I have to reiterate some things that I know I talked about before, but 25% um, of the net slot drop. I got to explain what that is. Because the newspapers and even the television and the radio, they keep saying, well, the Seneca Nation, have to, they have to pay 25% um, of their revenue. Well, it's not 25% of their revenue. Because revenue, when you talk about net revenue, you assume that you, when you're talking about revenue, you're taking out the costs. When you say net slot drop, what the Senecas are paying is 25% of all the money that goes into the slot machines minus the payouts. That They're giving 25% of that to the state. Then out of their 75%, all of the costs come out. The cost of the casino, the cost of the employees, the cost of um, the, the lease to the, to the Seneca people, the, the cost of the... Uh, of, um, the licenses for the machines, the um, the leases, the um, uh, you know all of the the contracts they have associated with, you know again with the brands of machines that they have there, their their slot attendants, their cocktail waitresses and waiters, the you know all of the, you know all of the costs. So when you when you take out all the costs of operating a casino, and operating a slot, uh, you know floor, that twenty five percent that the state took, literally off the top represents closer to 50% of the of the net revenue of a slot machine because no costs other than the, than the payouts came out 
before the state got their 25%. So, I mean, it's important people understand that. I know I've talked about it before, and, and so some of you are saying, yeah, you know, he's, he's mentioned this before, but, you know, not all of you are listening each week, so I've, I've got to reiterate this thing. But, so the, what the Senecas are arguing is that because these arbitrators have basically added language, both the term, another seven years, payments through 2023, and the percentage that needs to be paid, that wasn't in the agreement that the Senecas signed in 2002. So essentially, the two of these three arbitrators have added language to a compact. And so what the Senecas are saying, well, wait, wait a second, if, if we change the compact, that compact has to be put in front of the Interior Department. They have to approve um, changes in the compact. And in this case, the Interior Department is going to have to change, uh, is going to have to um, approve a compact that the Senecas didn't agree to. So there's a challenge there. Now, this isn't appealing what the, what the arbitrators have ruled. This is saying what the arbitrators have done is change the compact that, uh, that has to go in front of the, the Interior Department. Because it's a, it's a change in the compact language. And, you know, so what essentially exists today based on the arbitrator's ruling alone is there's a compact with a revenue sharing provision that the Senecas don't agree with. I mean, it, so it's not a compact. It, it, it is a dispute. And it's still a dispute. Because in order to settle, settle a dispute, the Senecas have to agree. This isn't something, I mean, this is, in being, impo is being imposed upon the Senecas. So what you have is, is a compact negotiated back in 2002, signed in 2002, that in 2019 is being altered, not by two sides negotiating, but by a couple of white men on, a, on an arbitration panel. And that's, that's a problem. I mean, it's, I mean, anybody could see that it's wrong. But, you know, it's a funny thing about the United States. They have, a, they have this thing that they call rule of law. And the problem, and that sounds good, right? Oh, yeah, we operate under rule of law is, is, is so important. Well, what happens when the laws are wrong? What, what happens when the laws are flawed? Slavery was legal. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've read that, that Justice John Marshall, um, uh, legal dicta associated with um, equating discovery with conquest. That's, that's law. And he says that. You know, look, if we can get away with, with calling discovery conquest, if we can get away with it by asserting it in the beginning and sustaining it, we can make it law. So even things that are wrong become law, become legal. So rule of law sometimes means the laws of rulers. And in this situation, this is what's, what has happened with, uh, with this arbitration, is they have decreed something that they're saying, they're, they're making a, a legal um, determination about a contract by telling one side, you didn't, whatever you agreed to, doesn't matter. We're telling you what the, what the contract is that you are now subject to. Not that you agreed to, that you're subject to. So that's the, the argument that the Seneca Nation is making uh, about this arbitration ruling, about paying, paying this. And, and again, what I, what I say to, to everybody, but especially the Seneca people, there's a lot at stake here. It's not because you can't, that, that your gaming isn't going to make money if you pay the state another billion dollars. But let me say it again. You're paying the state a billion freaking dollars. A billion dollars. That's a billion dollars that is being taken from you unjustly. Because two white men on, on an arbitration panel. And because, and this is, and I'm, and I'm going to get into some of the details here. Because you've got a governor sitting there in Albany who didn't even play a role in negoti negotiating this compact in 2002. It's a different governor. It's, in fact, it's three governors to go. And it's not even the same party. It was a Republican governor in George Pataki that the Seneca's, it was his administration that the Seneca's negotiated this compact. And when they negotiated this compact, the Seneca's put language in there that specifically called for payments through 14 years with no 
and people say, well, the, the compact is silent on payments past 14 years. Yeah, it's silent because there was no payments past 14 years. And you know what? Here's the, here's, here's the craziest thing of all. You know, so whenever I say, oh, you know, the, the, it went to, to arbitration and uh, uh, it's a fair system. The Senate has agreed to arbitration and, and so now they're bound by it. Well, I'll tell you what the Senecas didn't agree to. The Senecas didn't agree that two white men on an arbitration panel would rewrite the compact. That's what they didn't agree to. But here's the thing. You would think if, if arbitration was fair, and I'm, I'm going to blame the, the third guy, Kevin Washburn, uh, the native uh, arbitrator. I'm going to blame him for this too. Why didn't these three arbitrators ask the state specifically, where's your witness that was a part of negotiating this compact? Why didn't they pull somebody from the Pataki administration and say, we need testimony, not from the Cuomo administration, and not even from somebody who is just, I mean, maybe we could, we could, we could get some legal opinions on the, on the issue, sure. But what about an opinion from the, from the folks, from the, the Pataki administration that negotiated on behalf of the state when they put that language together that only talked about language uh, or uh, revenue sharing for, four, for 14 years? How is it that this governor could say, well, our interpretation of this thing is that the payments need to continue, and that's what we're going to try to uh, convince you arbitrators to, to rule in our favor. How could they make that argument without saying, well, um, we didn't negotiate that in, in 20, uh, 2002, um, so here's somebody who did. Because here's the question. I mean, I don't know what, what, a, what a Pataki representative would have said. I don't know what if one of his attorneys or negotiators, if, if, they, if they were asked the question, was it your intent to have payments continue past 14 years. I don't, I don't know what the Pataki administration would say. But regardless of what they would say, if they, if they did say, yes, um, it was our intent for payments to continue to 14, for, uh, past 14 years, then the question would, should, well, the next question should be, then why didn't you articulate that in the language? Why, is it a mistake? Because that's what everybody's saying. Oh, the state screwed up and they didn't make sure payments continue for, uh, for the next seven years through 2023. What, what, is it a mistake? Or, or wasn't, or, or, or was it that, that their plan? So you, you, gotta, you have to ask the state, if you had planned on payments continuing through the, uh, through the renewal period, why didn't you articulate that unless that wasn't your plan? And that, I don't think that question was ever asked. Instead, you have, especially the, this, uh, the third arbitrator, not the one appointed by the state or the one appointed by the, uh, the Senecas, but um, the one that was appointed by those two judges. He seemed to be pressing the issue and, and criticizing the Cuomo administration for the lack of clarity supporting the state's argument. But he never pulled up a Pataki administration and, and criticized them because maybe there was no criticism needed. I mean, that's, and, and see, you see, that's the point. And now, so if, you're, if your argument is that, yeah, the state did intend for payments to continue through 2023, but they forgot to put the language in there that calls for it, if you're going to say that, so you're going to say that about the, the Republican governor, George Pataki, his administration doing that. Well, okay, I guess you could cast that blame on the other party. But like I said, maybe the intention wasn't for payments to go past 14 years, even from the state. But th we never established that in, in arbitration hearings. But that only answers, that, that is only one of the, the issues. Because in the six months leading up to the renewal, the, the end of the first 14 years of this, uh, this compact, the one that included revenue sharing, there, was, there were these... Um, uh, milestones. So there was these, you know, calendar dates that both the Senecas and the state, if they had um, any changes they wanted to make to the compact, including language, including clarification of language, that they had by by certain dates they had to um, submit what they wanted in, in writing. So, as much as the Cuomo administration could say, well, um, this lack of clarity was due to what the, what took place during the Pat Pataki administration. Well, wait a second, that was 2002. What about in the run-up to 2016? When your administration, are you suggesting that your administration wasn't aware that the, there was a language problem? 
So you didn't even know, even though you guys went through a, a battle between 2009 and 2013, one that cost you $200 million, you didn't know? You're going to tell me, us three judges here, you're going to tell me that you didn't know that there was a language problem going into the renewal period? Or did you know there was a, a language problem? Because if you did know that there was a lack of clarity, was it your strategy not to address it during that period of time in the run-up to, uh, to the end of the first 14-year period? Was it your strategy to say, look, if we raise this issue, we may, you know, if we put a finer, if we shine a light on this thing, that might be bad for us. If we keep it in the dark, we can beat the Senecas in arbitration. That's our system. We control arbitration. That's our legal system. It's not theirs. We can beat them in arbitration. We get to appoint one judge, and 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 our judge gets to play a role in appointing the the uh, you know the, the third arbitrator. Yeah, we we can take them in arbitration. I would argue that either the Cuomo administration um, erred, or they intentionally avoided clarification of that language because they knew they wouldn't get it through. So, and I think the public needs to know that as these three judges heard testimony from the Seneca lawyers and the, and the, and the state lawyers, not once did the state offer the, the act, anybody who actually played a role in negotiating the compact in 2002 to, to clarify or to offer an opinion about what the intent of the language or the lack of language was. Instead, you have a governor, three governors later, after George Pataki saying, we need the money to continue, and we need to make you, you need to rule in our favor. And rule in the favor they did. At least the two white guys did. Now, <laughs> look, before I go to break here, every time I say that the two white arbitrators ruled against the Senecas, Especially folks from Niagara Falls. I get these folks from Niagara Falls. Oh, that's racist for you to call them white. For one thing, is calling somebody white an insult? Or is it racist just for me to point out that there's a, that there's a race component? That the two non-native judges ruled, they actually added language to a, to a contract, which is, Outside of what is acceptable contract law, the, the whole Four Corners doctrine. I mean, the, the Four Corners doctrine is that if the language isn't in the contract, you can't say that it's implied. The language has to be explicit, not implicit. And two of these judges said, yeah, we're going to use the legal principle of past practices that will trump, no, no pun intended, the actual language and that will trump the silence of the compact on payments the past 14 years. Man, that's a reach. That's a reach. And so I, I guess the point I'm trying to make that that is what the Senecas are at this point, at least that's what they've announced as their argument against this ruling from the arbitration panel, that they're going to, they, they want the interior department to approve or reject. And hopefully they aren't going to accept what the, what the Interior Department has done in the past, which is to say, well, we're neither going to reject or approve. We're just going to remain silent on all the things, which, which keeps it going. They, they need a ruling from the Interior Department. And frankly, the, the initial indicators are is that the Interior Department agrees that, with the Seneca's position on this thing. Why that wasn't presented in the arbitration is, you know, is a little bit bizarre, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in the second part of the second half of the show. All right, well, we'll take a break here. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. And I got a little bit more, so we'll we'll come back on the subject a little bit more after the break. Here's another song by Dark Water Rising featuring Charlie Lowry on vocals. And I think you'll enjoy this one. Don't cry. I really didn't mean it. In my own way, we were playing a game. I say don't go away 
All right, thanks for coming back. That's Pieces by Charlie Lowry and Dark Water Rising. Again, my thoughts go out to Charlie Lowry and uh, in her waiting game, waiting for a perfect match for a kidney transplant. Uh, and and as you look, if you judge somebody by no other means, if you judge Charlie Lowry by her incredible vocals along, uh, alone, we know that she will be uh, missed if she's not able to perform. And so a kidney transplant, uh, it will give her her life back and will allow her to uh, continue to pursue um, uh, a career that really is still has an opportunity to, to grow from where it is. So uh, again, my, my thoughts and my, uh, my, you know, again, my hopes and wishes for uh, success for, for Charlie Lowry in, in finding a, um, an adequate match for, uh, for a, a kidney transplant. Um, hey, look, I want to um, I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, uh, Let's Talk Native is sponsored by RJE, um, Ross and Holly John and the RJE family of businesses, uh, and by Eric White and ERW Enterprises, and a few others who, who make contributions from time to time. Um, hey, I, I posted, uh, you know, um, uh, a comment on, on Facebook um, about my good friend Neville Spring, who, who I today, I still use a MacBook Pro that he gave me almost 10 years ago. Uh, but it's it's starting to get a little glitchy here and there. It's it's ten years old. You can't update the operating systems on it anymore. But even things like this, a, a donation in this case, a gift. It was a birthday present, you know, that Neville had given to me. Um, this is why I need support because we do need to do upgrades. I'm you know I'm we're continually trying to you know keep our equipment running. Uh, we we bought some new microphones and we've got you know some other uh, less expensive gear. Uh, but honestly. I would never be able to afford a, a MacBook Pro um, had this not been a gift from a dear friend. Um, I, you know, and look, I realized that I could use a Dell laptop that would be fine, you know, or, you know, a regular, you know, uh, PC. But um, uh, it's been, I've enjoyed using the, the Mac product. And uh, and if I could, uh, um, you know, again, get people to support what we're doing here and uh, help me keep my equipment at the, you know, if not state of the art, at least uh, at least current, uh, it helps us do what we do here. So I want to thank all of you who who continue to support the the show, um, and I want to thank those of you who who supported in the past. Um, I also need to offer a thanks to those who share the show, especially my wife, who shares the Facebook live stream of the show onto so many group pages. Uh, I also need to thank those of you who are administrators of those group pages for allowing us to to have uh, a video of our show on your pages. That's the way we promote the conversation. And look, I know week in and week out, uh, there are some subjects that I um, cover uh, repeatedly. And, and this one on the, on the gaming, it's, like I said, it's important. We're talking about a billion dollars that the state is trying to squeeze. And, and it's really another billion dollars on top of the billion and a half they've ever gotten from the Seneca. And, you know, th this comes at a time when the state is competing directly against the Senecas, even with class three gaming. There's a casino down the road, you know, a hundred miles um, or so on the other side of Rochester and, and it's struggling. So, and the likelihood is, and here's, here's an interesting little tidbit here. Um, the likelihood is that the state is going to change what they get, what they receive. They're going to reduce the percentage that their state licensed casinos are paying. Why? Because they aren't profitable. Uh, the Lago Casino down the road, 100 miles or so, they can't even afford to pay their debt service down. They're only paying the interest. So they're not generating enough profitability. By the time they pay the state and, and, and their staff and, you know, and, and again, all of those costs I talked about that the Senate is at the pay out of their 75% of the net slot drop. By the time the, the Lago and the others, I mean, the Rivers Casino out in uh, Schenectady, another state licensed casino, Tioga, uh, down in the Southern Tier, another state licensed casino, and World Resorts uh, in the Catskills. They're, none of them are doing well. And, of course, the Senecas have lost market share. They've lost their revenue um, to not only these casinos, but there's casinos in Pennsylvania. There's casinos in Ohio. There's casinos in Niagara Falls, Canada. And, of course, the, the state almost immediately began competing against the Senecas for market share with their uh, racetrack casinos, three of which are right in the so-called exclusivity zone of the, uh, that the Senecas supposedly are buying uh, from the state 
you know, to the tune of $1.4 billion. So the state is considering reducing the percentage. And now they never said to the Senate, goes, well, maybe we need to ch- uh, change the percentage that, that you're paying. But I'll tell you, the Senecas don't need to change the percentage they're paying to the state based on what the state reduces the state license casinos for. That's not the same thing. Here's what the Senecas should be paying the, the state. They should be paying them something based on the value of what the state is conceding to them. And since the state isn't really conceding anything to them, there's no reason for the state Senecas to pay anything. But, but again, if you want to be fair, the standard for revenue sharing um, to pass what the Interior Department said is the test to make sure that the states aren't actually taxing these native casinos. The test is whether what the state has conceded for revenue sharing is both substantial and quantifiable. Well, in order to determine whether something is substantial, you've got to be able to quantify. So what's the value? Here's another thing that the arbitrators could have done. They could have said, we um, insist that some independent gaming experts evaluate, evaluate what it is that the state has given in terms of this so-called exclusivity. Before we can rule on whether the Senate have to pay, you know, regardless of the language, can the state really quantify that they're, that they're actually giving something? I mean, can the state provide proof that they've given something that is both substantial and quantifiable? I don't think they can. I don't think they can come up with an industry analysis on what they're calling this exclusivity. They sure as hell aren't going to come up with something that evaluates it at $1.4 billion for 14 years or a billion dollars going forward. Because look, and I've said this before, whatever the language was in 2002 that suggested the state would provide something to the Senecas and the Senecas would pay, which would give, uh, would have revenue sharing for that concession. That exclu- exclusivity the state promised, which was supposed to protect and give the Senecas a, a market advantage, whatever that value had in 2002, it decreased with every slot machine they put at the racetracks in, uh, well, actually throughout the state, but certainly even with the exclusivity zone, the 15 county area that w- runs from you know, the westernmost part of New, uh, New York all the way to the other side of Rochester, even within that area, every bit of gaming that took place that the state permitted that took place in in that zone decreased the value of that zone so every slot machine that went into batavia towns every slot machine that went into uh the hamburg fairgrounds every slot machine that went into um uh, uh the finger lakes uh racetrack every racetrack casino that was built throughout the state but certainly in that exclusivity zone reduced even as the senecas would, would their payment, uh, their their percentage would go from eighteen to twenty two to twenty five. Even though their payments increased, not just in total because of their gaming revenue increase, but the percentage increased. The value of what the state gave for that revenue sharing decreased, and now the state is in the market. The state is a direct competitor. Even if it, even if they did build. Delago on the fringe of the just outside the exclusivity zone. There's no question that Delago is competing for the same market share. They advertise here in Western New York. You hear them on the radio. You see them on television. You see it in the in print media. They are clearly trying to grab Seneca Nation market share. In fact, again, the the owners of uh, uh, of Delago, uh, the principals of of Delago uh, uh, Casino and Resort, say they can't compete against the Senecas especially if the Senecas aren't paying. Because their belief is that the reason they can't um, even pay debt service was because the Senecas weren't paying the state and they were uh, using that money to, um, to, for marketing and promotion. And that was putting the, the, the state licensed casinos at a disadvantage. The reality is the Senecas haven't spent any of that money. They put it aside. They're, it's in, in interest-bearing accounts. But they haven't, they haven't used... The, the advantage of not paying the state. They haven't, they haven't looked at that as, as windfall yet, that they could loosen machines, they could do more giveaways to, you know, to be tougher competition with the state. No, they haven't even gone there yet. 
That hasn't even begun. So anybody who thinks, well, hell, screw the Senate because we're not paying, we'll build a casino in Niagara Falls. Well, let me tell you about that. If the Lago, 100 miles away, right on the thruway, by the way, I mean, if they can't compete against the Senecas while the Senecas are putting money aside for the state, how the hell is somebody going to compete if the Senecas just flat out aren't paying the state? And, and there's, there's no more controversy. Who is going to finance a half a billion dollar enterprise? And that's about what it would cost to build even a modest casino. Who is going to finance that knowing that their gaming is already going to be built in a saturated market? Whether it's Niagara Falls, everybody says, oh, yeah, but Niagara Falls has a, has a tourism industry. Yeah, how, how well has Niagara Falls benefited from that? Um, the state has benefited from it. Seneca's have benefited from it, maybe. But uh, Niagara Falls is still kind of a rundown city, folks. So you can bra brag about how many people come to Niagara Falls, but they aren't exactly patronizing your other businesses, which is part of the problem. So if you think you're going to build a casino that's going to take market share away from the Seneca's, you're going to build something that's going to be shuttered in five years. For one thing, in order for, for the state to approve a, a, a casino in Niagara Falls, It'll take at least three years to do it because they actually have to go through the process of doing a, another constitutional amendment, which means it's got, they'd have to pass something to two successive state legislatures and then bring it up to public referendum. That's how they got the four bills that they built. But in order to, to change the law farther, to allow them to build more state licensed casinos, they'd have to go through that whole process again. So that's three or, three or four years out. Then it's going to take a couple of years to build something. And then somebody's got to find... The financing to build a casino that's going to compete against somebody who's got a huge regulatory advantage over them in a fairly saturated market. Sorry, Niagara Falls, this isn't going to happen. I've said it before, Niagara Falls would have been done well to cozy up to the Senecas and say, look, we want to work with you. You know, we realize that the state doesn't, uh, isn't entitled to any of your revenue sharing, but, but we're your neighbors, and I know you guys intended, and the reason you even entered into the revenue sharing was to try to benefit Western New York. So let's let's work on that. But no, you've got a jerk in uh, in Paul Deister who you know would rather say you either pay us or we're not going to let your casino burn if it catches on fire. That's that's the Paul Deister attitude. And that's the guy who goes to a 9/11 commemoration last year, comparing the first responders of 9/11 in New York City to the cavalry that massacred Native people at Wounded Knee and stuff like that. I mean, this is this is the Democrat, by the way, again, so when I suggest that racism um, is an underlying thing, even with the two white guys on the arbitra arbitration panel, racism isn't just something that, that is a Donald Trump thing. It is, racism isn't a right thing. It's a white thing, folks. So both Democrats and Republicans, Cuomo's made plenty of racist comments. Paul Deister made plenty of, has made plenty of racist comments. And they're Democrats. And, you know, so if you think that Democrats uh, aren't harboring some of these uh, these racist views, uh, you're just not paying attention. All right. Here's my final thing. The Senecas are only making one argument so far, at least at least publicly. They're making the argument that the arbitrators have rewritten the compact and that that's going to require uh, the Interior Department to uh, to review what these arbitrators have ruled. That's what the Senecas are arguing. And that's a good argument. It's a decent argument. The problem with that argument is it only addresses specifically the Seneca's um, uh, arbitration ruling. There's a bigger issue at play here, and, and I've kind of talked about it. The bigger issue at play is have states, not just New York State, but other states, <clears throat> have they violated the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act with the way that they have... Um, uh, created these provisions for revenue sharing because like i said the interior department has written clearly that in order for revenue sharing to be legal under the indian gaming regulatory act because because i gotta say say this clearly the indian gaming regulatory act prohibits both the state and the feds from taxing native gaming operations it pro it, it it prohibits it it's against the law for the state or the federal government, or municipalities, anybody to try to tax native gaming. Now, if there are costs incurred, and because we've had this conversation about, you know, perhaps the costs associated with, you know, you know, fire service or, you know, or various 
you know, utilities or whatever else that, that a municipality may uh, incur because of a casino. Look, that, that's different. That's not taxing somebody. That's, that's a, a fee for services. But the Indian Gaming Reg Regulatory Act prohibits taxation of native gaming. Now, when it comes to revenue sharing, I've said it before, and I just, I just said this in the first half of the show. Revenue sharing, for it to be legal, for it to not be a tax, the test is whether the state provides something of value that is quantifiable, that is worth the revenue sharing. So it's not just did, the, did New York State or any state provide something that is worth, in, in the case of the Senate, is worth $1.4 billion. That's not even the question. The question is, was it worth it to the Senecas to buy for $1.4 billion this concession from the state? So the concession actually has to be worth more than the $1.4 billion. Otherwise, it's just a wash. And why would you do that? Why would you, why would you create that? You know, I, granted, I, there's one reason for doing it, because 25% of that $1.4 billion came, uh, came back. Actually, more than 25% um, uh, of that $1.4 came back to, um, to Western New York which was what the Senate has had in mind. So the second argument isn't just whether the arbitration panel rewrote the Seneca's compact. The second argument addresses the, the bigger issue associated with revenue sharing. Are states, including New York State, violating the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act by taxing these casinos or by imposing a fee? And now there's no question that because of this arbitration ro ruling, what the state is going after over these next seven years through, through 2023 is a fee that they're imposing on the Senecas. Not a fee that the Senecas agreed to pay, but a fee that they, they're imposing on them. So that's something that the Interior Department, again, when I ask where, where, are, the, where are these questions to be answered, all three of the, the issues I'm going to bring up here are interior question, uh, um, questions that need to be answered. And they're, all three of them are questions that the Interior Department, which includes the Bureau of Indian Affairs, in case you didn't know, <clears throat> has been derelict in the responsibility for oversight. It is the Interior Department that has the enforcement powers and responsibility on the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. That's laid out in the law. By law, it's the Interior Department. The first thing they were supposed to do was either approve or reject gaming compacts. Well, there was a third option in there, which was to not make a ruling at all, which means that they, the gaming compact would, would go through without approval or rejection by the Interior Department, which is, to me, a dereliction of duty. The other thing they're supposed to do is make sure that the states and organized crime, this is the whole idea, you know, the, the, the whole reason for IGRA in the first place <clears throat> was supposed to be to protect the integrity of native gaming. It was supposed to protect them from aggressive states and from organized crime or any other nefarious characters that would try to strong arm, you know, uh, defenseless native people entering into a gaming market. Of course, there hasn't been a whole lot of oversight on what states do. Down in New Mexico, for instance, there was just a, a court case where several of the, the gaming, native gaming enterprises uh, pushed back against the state who was trying to not only elicit and, and impose a revenue sharing provision on uh, native gaming in New Mexico. But they're saying, we, we even want you to, to pay us a percentage of what you offer as free plays and promotion. They were trying to grab another $60 million or so out of these native game, you know, out of three or four native gaming enterprises. They wanted to get a percentage of what they were giving as free plays for promotion, which is absurd. And actually, the state or the federal uh, courts in New Mexico ruled against ruled against the state, which is a good sign. They actually there's some language in that ruling that suggests that the that the federal courts are concerned about the overreach by states and uh, when it comes to to uh, revenue sharing. And I got to assume that the Interior Department probably weighed in on uh, with some letter of support in that in that federal trial. So again, this whole notion of revenue sharing, especially for a concession, because that's the only way it's legal. This whole notion of revenue sharing, the Interior Department needs to, to evaluate. They should evaluate every state. In fact, every 
specific native gaming enterprise to make sure they aren't being um, uh, exploited, you know, or you know, extorted by the state. Which leads me to the third thing. So when we talk about extortion, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act requires that the states and the native gaming enterprise enter into um, a, a, a compact, a gaming compact. That's one of the, the prerequisites to operate, um, uh, you know, to, to start up a, a class three gaming enterprise, native class three gaming enterprise. What's not clear is what happens. And again, I've said this before on the show, <clears throat> in 30 years that IGRA has been in place, the Indian Gaming Regulatory uh, Act has been in place. In 30 years, no one has answered a simple question, is what happens if a state says, I don't want to enter into a compact with you anymore. I don't want to renew a compact. What does that mean? Does that mean the state can just, that, does that mean the states actually have the power to just shut down a native uh, class three gaming facility? By saying, I don't want to negotiate a compact with you anymore. I'm walking away from the compact. I'm, I'm canceling the one that we have or, or I'm not renewing the next one. Does, does that mean that the Class 3 gaming ends? See, there's nothing in, in IGRA that says that. Of course, there was something in IGRA initially <clears throat> that said if a state refused to negotiate um, uh, in good faith on, on native gaming, the native uh entity could sue the, the state and federal court but see that got that got removed from igra florida protested they said look you can't that violates uh whatever is the 11th amendment of the constitution you can't a federal law cannot force a state into federal court that's you know that's what you know the or the uh, again the uh, 11th amendment of the constitution uh, suggests something along those lines and the courts ruled in favor of the Florida, so they severed that. They severed the, that provision, which was recourse for a native gaming, gaming enterprise against a state that doesn't want to play ball. So in the absence of that, what does that mean? Does that mean that a state, New York State, for instance, look, there's a lot of reasons a state could walk away from a compact, not just because the, the Seneca's decided, no, we don't want to share revenue. That's one reason, which shouldn't be a legal reason. There's no way that a state should be able to be vindictive enough to say, look, if you don't pay me, I'm shutting you down. I mean, that's absurd that, 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 I mean, that's absurd that anybody could even think that. But that's a fear. That's a fear of, of many of Seneca Nation counselors. In fact, in 2013, when they settled their dispute with the state over these racinos or these, the state casinos in the exclusivity zone, I mean, the part of the reason, and in fact, the only clear reason that 16 counselors agreed with the president of the Seneca Nation at the, at the time to pay, uh, to give this, the state $400 million out of that $600 million in escrow <clears throat> and to continue paying for this exclusivity provision was because they were afraid the state wouldn't renew the compact in 2016. That's, and they said it. I mean, I, I talked to a bunch of the counselors and they, and they all said, look, we all agreed that if we didn't, if we didn't give the state something, then they, they may not renew. So by paying the $400 million, we got a commitment from the state that they would renew the compact. So they essentially paid extortion fees to the state. They said, okay, well, for $400 million, you'll agree to, to, to stay in, in a compact arrangement with us uh, for another, through 2023. But see, that's the 800-pound gorilla in the room. The question is, and IGRA... I mean, the Interior Department has to answer this question. That if a state walks away from a combat, because, <clears throat> again, that's only one reason. The state, New York State, could say, hey, look, we're not interested in having any gaming in, in New York State anymore. Because we have our own casinos that are struggling. So if we end our compact with you, you can't operate Class 3 gaming. I mean, that would be a perfectly sound um, strategy for the state to take to bolster their their state licensed gaming facility. It's unethical. I mean it's it's wrong on many it's morally wrong and it's ethically wrong. But in the absence of the of the interior department saying, wait a second, if a state walks away from a compact, that doesn't mean they can shut down native gaming. Nobody's answering that question. So the three questions that, that the interior department 
need to answer relating to this to the Seneca's deal in particular and more broadly. The first one is whether this arbitration panel can rewrite a compact. And that's unique just to Seneca's. But the other two, whether these revenue sharing provisions can pass the smell test on whether they are really just an imposed tax, that's something the Interior Department has to step up. And they need to step up nationwide about this thing. Otherwise, sue the, sue the crap out of the Interior Department for their dereliction of duty. And the other thing that they need to do, and it's it, again, it's pathetic that after 30 years of IGRA, that any Native entity, including the Seneca Nation, has to sit here in some sort of quaking fear that if they don't pay the, sen- uh, pay the state, that, what, they're going to get shut down, as, at least from a Class 3 gaming uh, standpoint? And again, I got to return my final thoughts here. The Seneca people, you need to literally poll your 16 counselors and say, we have three issues here, not just one. And we need, need to know, know where you stand. Because if, if you've been elected on, uh, as part of the Seneca Nation Council and you're saying, eh, I think we should just pay the state, then I think the people who vote for you should have a right to, right to know that, that, that you are that soft on, on this position with the state. And look, I know there's risk involved. And, and look, I'm not Seneca. So I, I, it's easy for me to talk tough, right? Because I'm not going to lose anything. And my annuity checks aren't going to get cut off. I don't get them. <laughs> but there is a, a precedent that the Senecas have the opportunity to set that can raise the bar for everybody in gaming. They could do something that could have real impact, not only for the Seneca's future, but for the future of other Native, uh, native enterprise. And look, I guarantee you the Oneidas are watching and the Mohawks are watching, but so are those folks down in New Mexico and throughout, you know, every, every state that has native gaming. So I had to revisit the issue. So, um, and hey, look, I'm going to stay on top of this. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to apologize to those who listen to the show that, that I keep harping on this issue. Again, this is the billion dollar battle, baby. This is a billion dollar battle. So I'll keep you posted. Look, I'll be back here on uh, on Tuesday, and we'll finish up the month, and then we'll jump into May after that. I'm John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Yowie.